one, zero. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. Live from the heart of the downtown east side, it's Talk Recovery Radio with Giuseppe Gansi and Darren Gale on Vancouver's Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. From the streets to the studio, bringing you addiction recovery stories from real people with lived experience and real experts on today's issues. Tune in live every Thursday, noon to one. Powered by New West Recovery. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. And good afternoon, Vancouver. Hello, hello. This is Giuseppe Ganchi, and I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Darren Gaylor. Hey, Darren. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Nice to see you, Darren. Yes. And uh, welcome to the show, everybody. If you're uh, watching us live on Facebook, welcome. If you're watching us on YouTube, click subscribe and follow all of our shows. And those are uh, uh, some of the replay places you can listen to us back on uh, Spotify and podcasts, uh, SoundCloud, and don't forget coopradio.org as well. And visit us on our website, talkrecoveryradio.com. So, Darren, it's uh, our seventh season of show coming on to our eighth season pretty soon. We like to start the show off with some uh, topics that are in the news. And uh, there's uh, something that came in in my news filter today. Uh, Trudeau urged to make decriminalization of illicit drugs a priority in Canada. And it's quite interesting because I, I opened the article. I'm pro decriminalization, the, the Portuguese model and the European model of decriminalization, uh, decriminalization accompanied by some type of commission like they'd got in Portugal. For those of you that don't know, they got the Commission of Drug Dissuasion. Vancouver is one of the cities that wrote a letter to uh, Prime Minister Trudeau urging him to uh, decriminalize drugs, but uh, that's it, just decriminalize drugs. There really is no, actually Vancouver insists that there is no commission of drug dissuasion. So my thing though, though, that I wanted to point out, and, and this is the piece where a lot of people don't see all the stuff going on in the background. So I remember listening to a city council meeting in Lethbridge that I was alerted about an agency was going to city council to get the city to write a letter to the prime minister. And uh, in this letter to urge that the city of Lethbridge supports decrim. And, and what I was, when I was doing some research for our movie crisis, uh, you, you can find that out on Facebook crisis documentary about the decriminalization model in Canada. There was an interesting thing that happened. So picture this, Darren, the prime minister has said he's against decrim. And, and so obviously he doesn't want to go out and say, I support decrim on his own merit because, you know, he doesn't want to be the guy, right? Which I don't know why he doesn't want to. But so how do you get Canada to change tune? So all these organizations across the country, city of Edmonton, city of New West, where we're located, have all kind of put together, you know, this request to the prime minister. So, so now the prime minister has all these official letters saying, hey, Canada wants to decriminalize. Mm. But something happened, and uh, it's going to be in the movie that we're going to produce. Something happened in Lethbridge where I think the person slipped, and uh, the city councilor was like, well, why are you here? And she said, well, the Minister of Health told us to do this. And it was interesting because it's like, wait a minute, that's Patty Haju and, and she's a liberal. And so she told everybody and they gave sue up grants to these organizations to go all over the country to show everybody how to create these letters pretty much. Like, it's just so corrupt. It's like, why is a liberal minister, Minister Patty Haju, giving taxpayer money to teach organizations to go around and, 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 and encourage city halls and all these other organizations to create these letters for prime minister to, you know, um, decriminalize drugs. I just, I, I don't know, I, I just found the whole thing was a slip of the tongue on her part. 
um, you know, I applied for the same grant for our recovery movements and all that kind of stuff. And we weren't told, you know, we'll give you $2 million to, you know, encourage recovery across the country. Um, it's just dirty politics. And, and I don't think people know that it will be in the movie one day when it gets released. Um, sadly, you know, a recovery movie doesn't get grants from the government. To, so we're fundraising to get the movie done. But like, what do you think? Uh, do you think that's interesting? Or do you think that should be looked at, Darren? I mean, of course. I, I mean, I, we've got to be careful. Our, our show's going to turn into an investigative, uh, you know, reporting. Uh, well, platform. no one else is doing it. That, it's like, <laughs> she said that, you know, at City Hall. Well, Patty, had you told us to do it like this? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't shock or surprise me. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's it's just so troubling um, in, in all aspects of, of, of government, especially with, with Trudeau and I, I mean, there's, 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 I just, there's, I no don't faith. there's no faith that, that anything is, is actually about and for the people, you yeah. know, like, I mean, decrim, of, of course, it, it, it's things, you know, this should be, you know, a part of our, our policy. Um, I mean, I, I, when I was, when I was using dope fiend, I mean, I got busted with every single substance I've shared this before. I mean, it was, it was beyond a waste of time for, for anybody mm -hmm. to arrest me. I, I, I don't think that's, it's, it's really going to change anything. The question still is like, you know, what, what resources do we have yeah. for, for the individual? And that's the whole like, point. It's like, why, if we're going to follow the evidence, why aren't we actually following the evidence? Like, yeah. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's just this, hey, let's decrim drugs and, 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 you know, you do drugs, no problem. It's not like that in Europe. And a lot of people are, are have been given mistruths about the European harm reduction model. And like, like I said, you can't even smoke weed in Portugal without getting, you know, some type of um, conversation with somebody in regards to your weed use. So, and, and it's, and it's just not a message of, of hope. And, and opportunity and possibility that that I want to support and 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 share and and you know our show to be about mm. so it's just like yeah it needs to be done sure get it done yeah. whatever but it you know it, it doesn't it, it doesn't bring about a sense of like yeah. oh this is going to you know this is going to revolutionize the you know our government and our policies and and our resources for for people in addiction so well, it's just this article came out and you're like, oh, wow, city halls and, and organizations across Canada want to decriminalize drugs. It's a community thing. No, it's not. It was actually, you know, done from the top up, told, hey, go to your city halls, go to your, you know, nonprofits, your big ones and, and get this letter campaign. And so that way Trudeau one day has all these letters and it's just so dirty. And it's just so like it's it's the article from CBC, uh, makes it look like it's, you know, the community driven, the community talks. Uh, I, I, everybody, guess what? Safe supply is going to be the biggest money maker in this country because safe supply is not free. So let's, it's just bizarre. Anyway, I uh, hope you like what you're listening to. And if you don't, you'll let us know on Twitter. So thanks for that. <laughs> and uh, we come to you every Thursday, noon to one. Uh, Talk Recovery Radio, powered by New West Recovery, Canada's recovery community. We're about recovery-oriented systems of care and how does harm reduction build recovery capital in people's lives? That's a question that we're still trying to figure out. Um, so hopefully one day we find an answer to it and, and actually put a stop to overdoses and the billions of dollars we lose in this country in addiction related costs. So every week we have some amazing guests on our show talking about the many pathways of recovery. Last week, uh, the show was all about harm reduction and harm reduction in the United States. This week, we've got an interesting show as well. Darren, who are we talking recovery with today? Yeah, right on. Super excited to uh, talk recovery with Dr. Amy Johnson. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you guys so much for having me. Right on. So bear with me here. Uh, you are a psychologist, author, speaker. Uh, you have a groundbreaking new approach that helps people find lasting freedom from unwanted habits, anxiety, and self-doubt. Uh, the author of Being Human, The Little Book of Change, The No Willpower Approach to Breaking Any Habit, 
and just a thought, a no willpower approach to end self doubt and make peace with your mind. Uh, you also have the little school of big change. Uh, Lots of stuff. <laughs> the podcast changeable and has been regularly featured on the Steve Harvey show, Oprah.com, Wall Street Journal, Dr. Oz, Self Magazine. Amazing to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Um, now on your website and, and people and our listeners have to check this out, uh, dramyjohnson.com, so many resources, free resources. Uh, you can take a look at the school of, uh, the little school of big change. Um, but it, it speaks about your own personal issues with anxiety. Um, can we, can we start there? Like what you discovered not just from obviously becoming a psychologist and, and, and working with thousands of people and, and, and coaching, but your own personal story, how did that help with, you know, this changeable approach? Yeah. Um, my own personal story is really what's behind it. You know, I, uh, I was kind of an anxious kid, uh, just always trying to figure out like, why are these, why are these adults so crazy? Why do they think so much? Why do they worry all the time? What's up with money? Like, why, why do they fight all the time? Like, you know, and just from a time I was really young, just wanting to kind of, uh, knowing I wanted to study how the mind works and how people work. And I uh, picked up a lot of those habits of the people I was around. So I was a, a worrier. They called me, I had pan panic attacks from the time I was little um, which really kind of came to a head when I was in graduate school. And I had a lot of issues with anxiety at that time. Um, and then I thought, uh, I thought the anxiety was better, but it had transitioned and kind of morphed into food issues. And I struggled with an eating disorder for eight years. So in that time and all of that, you know, I, I did everything that I knew to do. I had access to great psychologists and all the right therapies and a lot of those things were helpful. A lot of things helped, but it always felt like there was just deeper we could go, you know, like, like it felt like I was managing stuff. I was applying stuff. I was like a few steps away from like falling back into something. So it didn't feel like freedom. It felt maybe like sobriety or abstinence or whatever, but it didn't feel right. like freedom. Yeah. That, and that's, that's ultimately the point. I mean, yeah. granted that, you know, that abstinence, part in the beginning is is crucial um but yeah we always always hope that there's more than just that um the, I'm, I'm interested do you have a personal philosophy then you know or theories like on you know addiction mental health or or anxiety as disorders and and all of that um as as you you know your approach is sort of a no willpower approach do you do you have some theories on that like whether our medical system and and like you know our typical psychologists are just you know maybe you're going about it you know I, not too well <laughs> i think there's a lot of uh, nice. a lot of innocent misunderstanding going on i think innocent misunderstanding we'll call it innocent misunderstanding. <laughs> let's let's give everyone the benefit of the doubt i right think you know, really and really i think yeah. that wants to help so many people are so well-meaning coming into trying to help um but it's rooted in old old misunderstandings and i would say first of all we aren't we aren't our experience so we have this psychological experience thoughts feelings behaviors we live in a sea of this but that's not who or what we are and it totally feels like who and what we are most of the time for most of us so we are, it's like, I like to use this metaphor of like having a helmet on. It's like, we have a helmet on that's full of thought and we have no idea we're wearing a helmet. We just think this is life. This is me. This is what I do. I'm an addict. I'm anxious. I'm depressed. And we don't really see, cause no one ever told us until they do that. Hey, you're not the sum of your psychology. Psychology comes and goes, it moves all the time, but there's something that doesn't come and go that that we can be curious about and look into and that's what i see how that's that's ultimately what helped me because i spent years trying to fix my psychology like make my thoughts and my feelings different make my actions different and again it kept me in the sobriety land for a little while but it was never freedom it was so much work and it wasn't until i started to see what's beyond psychology that that things got much better 
I love that because I mean, a, a lot of our audience, my own personal experience was such, um, uh, it, it, it was, it was so much work, you know, in that beginning. And there was so much of that, uh, you know, coming out of addiction, the things I've done, the people I'd hurt, the relationships I developed and destroyed that this, this was who I am, you know, and, and our audience, I'm sure have all asked ourselves the same question, you know, who am I? And yeah, we hear things. I, you are what you think you are what you do. Um, you know, and that's, it's tough psychologically to, to understand that, you know, who are we based on our, our life of habits and what we do most often? Um, I mean, let's, let's talk about that. Like as, as far as, you know, in the addict's perspective or, or, you know, a, a person that's just over time been engaged in so much unhealthy habits like what is that psycho psychological approach when they when they look at changing? Um, is there is there an acceptance or an admission that 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 is who who I was or who I who I am? You know, based on that, and how do we sort of change our minds? Well, I mean, to me, it just doesn't look like that was ever who we were. So it looks like like we we do the best we can see to do from the thinking that looks real. So when you're a little kid, you're afraid of the monster in the corner and then you grow up and you see, oh, that was just a shadow. Like, of course, you're going to cry and call for your mom to come to the bedroom when it looks like a monster. That's the, that's how life looks. Then as we grow up, we see differently. So I think it's the same for all of us all the time. Like from our, from the way things appear to us, from our current level of understanding, we do what makes absolute best sense. And that includes addiction. That includes hurting people that includes destroying relationships. We're not setting out to do any of that. I don't believe there's a single person on the face of this earth that, that wants to be miserable or wants to hurt other people or that that is who they are. But, mm -hmm. but we get so tangled up in our thoughts and feelings. And then we try to solve for them and fix them and find a way out and we're afraid of what we feel, you know, so we push it down and we repress it and all of that, mm -hmm. that it, it, even when you, you know, when you lash out at someone or you go back to your addiction, that is your, the best way you can see in that moment to relieve the pain that you're in. Is it wise? Is it healthy? No, but yeah, a lot of it is, moment, it's, it's the best you can see it's getting the awareness too. I mean, until I started a recovery journey, I had no idea what the saying was, you hurt the ones you love most. Like I had no idea what that even meant. I may have seen it in a Hallmark movie or something like that, but I never really understood the concept that my actions actually hurt other people. And I don't know if it was because I didn't care or what it was. And now that I understand that it's like, oh, my actions you know, are important because they do affect people, places and things. So how does one know when a habit's bad? You know, like I, I know people that um, become uh, yoga maniacs, uh, you know, where it's just like, that's all they do is yoga every day and, and, and fishing and, and gambling and card playing and sports. And so where does passion so how does this book maybe help with that too? Because Darren and I, we come from the addiction place. So obviously if you're doing things you never said you thought you'd do doing heroin, probably a bad habit. But <laughs> how do you get out of the addiction world and just, you know, people in recovery, long-term recovery, you know, how do you, how do we know our habits are bad or what, what's your take on that? Well, I think, you know, I think in some ways it's a great question, but I also think it's a question like we all kind of know if you just use some common sense. So yeah. like our, you know what I mean? Like we can think we don't, we can think, oh, what's going on here? We can be in some degree of, you know, denial about it. But I, I mean, I think a great question is like, are you free? I mean, I've had many, like you mentioned, yoga habits, exercise habit, like certain things that have a, have a pull to them where, if, where I could put a happy face on it and say, Oh, this is a healthy habit. It's great. Work is a, is a great example. People have overworking habits. No. It looks good on the face. <laughs> it looks good on the face of it. But what if someone says you can't do that for a week? How are you going to feel? What if you can't do it for a few hours? You know, like that's where we can all just look at that ourselves and see like, does this have a hold on me? Or am I truly free? I can take it or leave it. And look, we're human beings. So I'm sure there are many things that do feel like they have a hold on us, maybe for life. And that's okay. It's just, you know, it's just kind of good to check in with that and see. Yeah. I mean, 
as a psychologist, I'm sure you're well aware. I mean, the the lack of common sense that can take place in that, you know, that inability to just stop doing what's what you may see as as common causing some harm, you know, the denial, uh, you know, in some areas called insanity, you know, where we just we just get locked in and you know have a difficult time self-identifying and need that person or partner or, you know, or willing friend to say, Hey, like, like stop that. Like you're, you know, you're ruining and sort of like to, to get us to a place of common sense is, is that what sort of, you know, in the book, will it, will it help be that sort of, you know, accountability to take a look at, you know, what you may not have deemed as very harmful uh, as a habit. Will, will, will the reader be able to sort of self-identify or begin to? Yeah, I think, um, I think what it does is we kind of come to see that we are in our thoughts, we are in our feelings, we're, we're something else, impossible to describe in words, but there's some essence, some energy there, right? That is, that is not thought and feeling that's always moving and changing, that we always do what makes sense in the thinking that shows up. And then that thinking changes a hundred percent of the time. So we're always kind of flowing through life in a sense. And that as we stop taking all this so seriously, and I, of course, I mean, I, I don't want to make this sound like I'm saying addiction's not serious. I don't mean that, but I mean, every thought and feeling that moves through our head is not the truth. <laughs> and it is not about us. Like our, a, a mind just talks, thought shows up and it is not all about us in our life. And it sure as heck isn't all accurate. So right. as we get a little looser with that and we kind of see, oh, wow, this is fluid. There's a narrator in here talking and it's, I don't need to hang on all of that. It sounds so simple as I say it, but it's like a whole, a lot of relaxation happens. A lot of like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, I have a mind talking, but I'm also being lived. I'm also lived by common sense. I know when I'm hungry. I know when I have to go to the bathroom. Like, I don't have to think all this through. And when people kind of let go of their intellect and their mind a bit, it still runs, you know, it still helps them, but we kind of get in touch with that bigger thing that's helping. And I, I think that's kind of common sense. Yeah, I mean, a, a mentor of mine, a, a wise person, often described the importance of of awareness that leads to insight that eventually leads to intuition, and and, and that you know change is is about getting to that place of intuition where it's not it doesn't feel like I'm forcing myself and having to, you know, write on the mirror, big affirmations of what I need to do and convince myself that it becomes a, a natural flow. Yeah. Right. And, and I don't know if so many people allow themselves, you know, to get to that work to, I, I think we're talking about that sense of freedom. Yeah. Um, what is it based on willpower that gets in the way? in your experience. Well, I love how you said that, like that sense of freedom, I think is what we are. It is who we, I mean, there's a, a lot of words we could put to this, but that that's natural. Look at a little kid, right? They yeah. kind of just float through life. <laughs> they have a lot of thinking and they have a lot of moods and emotions. I mean, they can have a temper tantrum on the floor of target. And then two minutes later, they're happy as can be like, so there's, it's not like their life is just easy and they're always happy at all, right. but, but they live by that flow and that common set, that intuition. And we all can, we, that we don't grow out of that. But what happens is we start identifying with our mind. So we start identifying with our thinking so much. And that's exactly, that's the only thing that's ever in the way. In any given moment, that's the only thing in the way. Right. So anytime we even have that urge or craving or are about to start that, pick that fight or whatever it is, it's like our mind is just really active and we're very identified with it. And as it settles down, no matter how no matter what diagnosis anyone has as their mind settles down they start to feel more at home more in that flow and that intuition again i mean this like you can be depressed schizophrenic anything these things settle down the experience of that settles down as our mind settles down because they only live in our mind so yeah. willpower is like jumping into your mind saying, I'm going to fix this, darn it. I'm going to make things go my way. And it, and it takes us in the opposite direction. It's very logical. It has a weird logic to it, right? It kind of feels like it should work, 
And it does sometimes for little things like you can willpower, you know, your way through a work day or something. I don't know, but you, I don't see many people willpower their way through an addiction or anything, you know, substantial. Yeah. I think a lot of people would call that white knuckling it. It's like, yeah. <clears throat> I can hold on to my chair. I can hold my breath, but for so long, like yeah. you need to do which may be in your book, you need to do something to actually make the change. And, um, you know, part of what you do is offer a six week program. You know, I believe it takes time and work to actually form new habits or responses to behaviors that you can acknowledge. I like to use the word honor as well. It's like, you know, I need to honor like who I, who I have been and understand that I can make change rather than going to what you're saying, you know, I'm going to change. Well, how, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm going to build a house. doesn't matter how much I scream. I'm going to build a house. I ain't going to build one because I don't know how, you know, <laughs> like I need to learn how to do it first. So in this six week program, can you give us some hints, ideas, um, uh, key points that, that can help us learn how to build that house in this, you know, uh, soundbite. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it's actually really, again, it, it, it goes back to the, the what's there beyond all the thinking kind of conversation. It's like when our mind relaxes and, and, and we aren't so identified with everything floating through our heads, we see a lot. Like we kind of know what to do. You might not know how to build a house because that's a, you know, that's a certain skill set you need to go learn. But when it comes to being free of anxiety, depression, addiction, we already are. Honestly, we already are. We just are so identified with the depressed thinking or the anxious thinking or the addicted thinking. And that's what has us acting that out. So it's entirely subtractive. It's, it's like when we see through all the, all the willpower and all the thought and all the stuff in the way, we are in a place where, where we are kind of free of this stuff. I don't know if that sounds like, I don't know, you guys can tell me what, what questions you have about that, but you know, we weren't, none of us were born with addictions. None of us were born with this stuff. It's learned. Yeah. So when our learning relaxes, when our learning mind relaxes, we get these bits of freedom. Now that doesn't mean somebody's mind relaxes and suddenly they like never drink again, but it's like, we, we touch that place. You get, you get familiar with like, wow, I am okay here. And then your mind revs up and then you go back, but you just learn that over and over. Like this isn't me, this, uh, you know, whatever, this is all metaphorical, but like, you know, this quiet and this common sense is me. The health and the peace is me. The habitual thinking is never me. I absolutely, you know, resonates with, with me. I mean, it's, 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 all, there's sense of old school philosophy there. Like the, you know, the, the, the native sweat lodges, the Buddhism philosophies, the, you know, the walkabout where it's like, you just, you just go and, and until that, that all, you know, goes away and, and that, that current environment that's, you know, stimulating your thought process and negative affirmations and stress and pressures can go away where you can be in touch with yourself and, and know for ourselves, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what needs to change, what makes me happy. And, 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 and then there's just, I mean, am I going to engage with that? Right. Or am I just going to get, allow myself to, to get sucked back in? Um, so, my question would be how how important is is a break from that environmental stimulus that's causing so much you know when when i'm i'm looking to you know to read your book and 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 find that place like you know can i do it in maintaining my 9 to 5 and kids and you know all of that jazz yeah yeah i mean you know because how often I hear what you're saying. And I think you're right. Like there's, again, that's something our own intuition and common sense will, will kind of help us with to some extent, sure. but you know, so you might not want to like go read the book and like, see all this sitting at a pub, you know, like you might want to, <laughs> you might want to use some common yeah. sense, right? but, but like how often have we all thought, 
oh, I need to like go off on a, you know, six month solitary retreat or, yeah. you know, you're going to write a book like, oh, I need to clear my calendar for a year and have my book cabin ready. Like, come on, you can't do that stuff. Most of us can't, you know, if you have a family, especially. Yeah. So, but, but I think that's the, like, that's the picture our mind puts out. Like, oh, I need to be free of all this. The all or nothing. Is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All or nothing. We're free already. We just want to keep seeing what keeps getting in the way. Mm. You know, it's just this little thinking. I mean, it's big, but it's little. It's like this little voice that we are such a fish in water to. We don't even know it's a voice anymore, you know, and just a little bit of getting onto that. I think being in your everyday life with your kids and your job, that's a beautiful way to do it because you're going to get tested out the wazoo. <laughs> like you're going to constantly get tested and Hey, there's thought again. Mm -hmm. I wish people, I wish you can transcend the, you know, and, and the recovery I got that clean in, it's a spiritual awakening. If that's not what you do, but I, you know, people that I talk to that have gone through mental health issues and, and come through the other side, uh, people in recovery, drug use, alcoholism, there's that moment where it's just like, you know, you talk to somebody that's suffering and it's like, if they could just, you know, under like it's just one more step or just one you know and it's just so much easier but because i remember you know showing up many years ago being like this is impossible this is not you know because my interpretation of life is what my reality was what do you think like what do you tell somebody that uh whether it's substance use or somebody with mental health issues that's still really stuck in the problem you know i work in a rehab center and we have new people here all the time where life is just you know kill me now you know kind of that kind of attitude so what are some tips that you suggest to families we have a lot of parents that watch our show and listen to us as well that's one of the biggest thing i just can't get my kid to you know, and then they see all these, you know, people in recovery and they just, you know, have, they, they get sad because their kid's not buying in. So I guess that's the question. How do you help somebody understand the buying in process, whether it's anxiety, trauma, recovery? How do you help with the buy-in part? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, and it's, it's um, so hard for people who are trying to help because what you're really pointing to is that we can't we don't have any control over that. You know, like we can, mm -hmm. we can be there, we can support, we can point in a direction, we can show them what's possible. We can remind our kids like, Hey, this is not you. Like, I know you, you know, and this is not you. All of that can be super helpful, but we have no ultimate control over it. Um, but I think, you know, I think conversations that help people insightfully see for themselves, like, wow, there is something other than this. So for example, when, when, um, when I was caught up in anxiety or my eating disorder, like I, you would have asked me at that time. And I would have said, yeah, this is on my mind all day long. Like it's all I think about. It's all I feel it's, it's, it's everything. And of course that's not true. Like I felt horrible. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It was, it was bad, but it wasn't on my mind all day long. I held a job. I did things like there. I laughed. I watched movies. I, you know, I laughed at jokes like that sounds minor, but it's huge because our, our brain generalizes everything. Our mind stare. It has to just for efficiency sake. So it'll say I'm an addict. I'm depressed. I have this problem and it'll truly feel like it's there 24 seven. And it's not. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes people notice this thing of like, you wake up in the morning and you're kind of okay for a second until you remember your problem, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's really huge. Or as you're falling asleep at night, as your mind settles down, you're like, whoa, I'm actually okay. Unless you wake back up and remember your problem. So little pointers like that, I think just really start to open the door for people. I, I like, I, I, I mean, just the idea of, of asking, you know, somebody, your partner at the end of the day, how your day was. It's, it's a generalized response. It's, it's never like, well, I had this amazing moment, you know, for 15 minutes, I felt connected to the universe. It's just like half an hour ago, I was stuck in traffic. Like, it, yeah. it, so it's responses, <laughs> you know, it yeah, a horrible I day. Didn't have a very good day. Like we, we, yeah, what a habit to just be so non-specific with our experiences day to day. Like, and just, I mean, it's just kind of cluing into me now how detrimental that is to my psyche and, yeah. and, and how I, 
yeah, maybe discount so many actual positive experiences in my quote unquote generalized, not so great day. And that's, that's what happens when we're identified with a thinking, it totally looks that way. We have all the evidence to prove yeah, it. Yeah. We feel bad, you know? So that's the cool thing about like being able to notice thought come and go, but not being so identified with it. You tend to remember more of those nuances. So I, I know a bad habit for, you know, for most folks is like, you know, focusing on the negative thing. Like what, what is some, what is a, a, a good habit to sort of replace? Like, like if something amazing is happening and it's only going to be, you know, four minutes of gratitude, say out of the whole day, like, like, should we do something in that moment? Should we express it? Should we make a phone call? Should we like share that story with someone? I mean, I don't, you, you should do whatever feels right to you. I think each of us, it's hard. I want a psychologist, a, a, a psychologist uh, perspective. Yeah, Darren needs help. So <laughs> We can talk after, but no, I think, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a really great point. Like even this question is like the kind of points back to like, no, our common sense will show us like, what would a kid do? A kid would just milk the heck out of any moment, right? They just are fully in it. They don't need anything to cement it in place. Like, and they also fully have this, this sense of like, yeah, there's going to be more of these because they're just living in the flow of life. So mm. again, I feel like it comes back more to subtraction, to seeing how our mind tells us this, this might never show up again, or this is who you are. And as that falls away, I think those, those positive moments just come to life naturally. Amazing. You mentioned in some of your information uh, about circuitry of the brain, and a lot of people talk about habits, about, you know, neuroplasticity, and there's all this data out there. So I wanted to touch on that before the show ends. Um, you know, there's books out there and, 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 and people that say, you know, it takes so much time to break a habit in the brain, like the, the actual brain needs this much time. And, you know, what is all of that? And do you touch on that in the book? Because, you know, there's the spiritual piece, there's the learning piece, there's, there's all of, you know, your environment piece, but then there's the brain and the brain builds this circuitry. So how does that play into the little book of change and, and your ideas of breaking habits? So I think, um, I mean, I've read all those brain books too, and heard about them. And there's a lot, you know, about like rewiring and doing this and that. And oh, yeah, I, rewiring the brain, that one too. Yeah. 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 And that's, <laughs> it's fine. Again, it, it's, it's all well-meaning. It's great. It has a lot of helpful stuff in it, I'm sure. But what I see is a lot of people, and I was this way too, that are like, oh man, like I have to rewire my brain, like my brain, like <laughs> how do I do that? Right. And it just feels like we're up against the biggest, the biggest thing there is, you know, our mm. own brain. So what's really interesting though, is that if we, if we go with this premise, like we've been talking about that, we have everything we need that we're healthy at our essence. We just think we aren't. That, that it's subtractive, that when our mind settles down, our health and our habit freeness rises to the surface because that is who and what we are. The same thing happens in the brain. I mean, our physical body, as we know, you cut yourself, it's automatically healing. The minute the cut happens, your body's already healing it. Our brain is the same way. Yes, things get kind of, you know, fused together to think of it that way, I guess. Habits happen in the brain but they are sustained because we think they're super important and we identify with them. So when I would have an urge to go binge eat, for example, all of this chemical stuff would happen. I would, I would usually act on almost always act on that urge. Cause I thought I had to, and it felt so uncomfortable. And I thought, this is me. Here's my addiction showing up. Now, as I kind of started to see, wow, I'm not my brain. My brain, sure, my brain has these habits and it tells me to do things at certain intervals, but, and it might feel uncomfortable, but I'm not that. It was almost like this space opened up where my brain would still go through whatever it needed to go through, but I saw I wasn't it and I didn't have to do everything it suggested I do. And that's what I work with people on. And it's amazing because our brain, your brain will rewire on its own when you're not so afraid of it and we're not giving it so much attention and energy and identification. So it's almost like a, you know, like the space opens up really this distance and, and you can, your brain will do whatever it needs to do. And again, I'm kind of simplifying it. I'm not mm -hmm. saying you don't feel this stuff, 
but you know, for a long time after my eating disorder ended, I would still have thoughts about going through those behaviors. They just didn't feel like they had so much power. And I, I'm sure that happens with most addictions that the thought is still shows up, but you're like, no, I don't do that anymore. That's, that's what's possible. I think yeah, that that's, ex that's exactly right. I mean, that, that and, sounded and I really know, good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if people can actually believe that in the beginning, that that is going to go away. I mean, it's just like, don't go down that street, yes. you know, don't go back to those old places because it'll trigger you and you'll use. And it's like, okay, self-protection overload, you know, let's, let's protect ourselves and, and, and do what we need to do. But that that eventually goes away where it's like, you can walk down any street, any, anywhere, and it doesn't own us. Right. And that's and freedom. I, that's what we were saying, right? Like that's freedom. I'm not afraid of yeah. anything that comes my way because I, I'm, I'm not it as opposed to sobriety and maintenance and all that is like, yeah, trying to not walk down the scary street. And this, yeah. uh, this, this is just a follow-up question to that. Does that mean that at that point, the work terminates like that you don't have to sort of be mindful of, you know, the, the, the changing uh, solutions that you, that brought you to that point, like that's because I know there's you know a lot of our viewers and listeners. It's this, I'm in recovery. I have to do this. You know, I'm I'm in this program, and and it's always enforced usually in the beginning for most of us, but then it becomes a choice. Yeah. You know, choose to continue or not, and we often see that when people stop you know, doing that, like it's a constant reminder that it, it's, it's back to old behaviors. And, and what's your view on that? Well, I think if you're actively trying to maintain something like through some sort of willpower, you know, or white knuckling, it can't be minor, but if you have a role in it and you're actively trying to maintain it, then yes, you let that go and whoosh, here comes the old stuff back. But when you've had a true sea change, like like when, like an insight when you've truly seen, yeah, I'm not that. And my mind can give me really big urges and I, I don't do that anymore. It doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to me. Then it's effortless. And when that, when and how that happens is kind of a mystery is different for everyone, but I think there is a shift for sure that happens. And, and that's the million dollar question too. Well, billion dollar question in today's world. Uh, you know, why is it different for everybody and why did they get it and why didn't they not get it? And, you know, and then the, the world of pathways, you know, fight at that point. Right. I, I mean, I, I wish I knew, um, uh, and we had, an, I mean, we talk about all the different pathways, but it's, it's that one point that you just made that we hope, you know, we're all just trying to do our best trying to get people there and, and people have the freedom of choice on who they want to get their help from and, and so forth. But you know, your book, I just wanted to share the, uh, the, the title, there it is, the, the little book of big change, the little book of change. Um, so, uh, is this also good for families to read if they have a loved one that uh, needs a little change in their life and then they find out that they also need to change in their life? Uh, like who's the book intended for, eh? Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's full of like short stories of people I've supported and how they've had insights along the way. So yeah, it's good for a lot of people. That's good for a lot of people. So if you're looking to uh, make some change or have some, I don't recommend you giving this to your wife or to your partner <laughs> as a present though. I, I think uh, you hint, should read it first and hint it, leave it on the, on the night table. And if they happen to see it, let them see it. That's what some people do that I know. <laughs> um, so, the, you know, one thing that I wanted to share about talking about, you know, I'm not that anymore, you know, for, for people, a lot of people in recovery that watch this show, it's like, when you're brand new you know i i lived in the west end of vancouver and you know did a lot of stuff in the west end and when i was new new like like i saw the bars and i saw the patios and i saw the corners and everything was constantly this is where i did this this is where i did that this is where i did that and sometimes i drive people or hang out with people that are brand new and it's like oh this is what i did there this is what i did there and just these horror stories right um and like I was, a, I went to, I don't live in the West End anymore, but Tuesday I went down to a meeting. And to me, it's just like, 
it's a neighborhood you know that's all it is you know there's there's buildings yeah there's some interesting things that go on in the west end but there's a lot of good things that go on and it's kind of like i had this filter if it's good i don't see it if it's toxic and dirty and it's gonna get me you know something i you know i just got attached to it so you know in that space, you know, understanding that this isn't me, uh, you know, I like the idea too that you know when you when you don't know much about getting well, you're powerless. But then this this kind of empowers you to understand like how to move forward in life. And so, if I'm taking your, you know, is is part of the six week course that you take is is it taking a look at like what you you do in life? I, I'm trying to figure out like if I take this six week course, what I'm going to get myself into and and so forth. And why is it six weeks? Well, I love what you said about, I think it's just, there's actually a chapter in the book about this, because I think it's so important how, how different things look and feel as you move through and, and further away from things. I just think that message, because I mean, me too, for the longest time in early recovery and all of that, it was like, I, I can't keep this up for life. Like I'm still, I wasn't doing my thing, you know, but I was still bombarded with that. And I just think it's so cool to see how the same West end will look completely different to you someday. And that's kind of, that's kind of magical and miraculous, but it you really start does. smelling the flowers. You start yes. seeing that there were flowers. <laughs> they were always there, but you couldn't yeah. see them. So yeah. that alone is just so worth it. So worth hanging out yeah. in. Um, so yeah, in the six week course, I mean, we really look at how kind of, as we've been talking about here, how our mind works, why it repeats things over and over, like why we have habits and addictions and things like that in a, in a very simple way, not a super scientific way, but just so that we can see, oh yeah, so there's sense to this. It's not me. I'm not an addict. I'm not, a, I'm not weak. I'm not this horrible flawed person. This is my brain actually working the way that brains are supposed to work. I've just gotten tangled up in it and identified with it. So it kind of goes through a lot of that. And we look at things like setback and relapse and all of that, but from this really different lens, it's like you have a setback or a relapse, like kind of in a sense, of course you do. Your mind has been talking about doing this thing for a long, long time. So it makes sense that it might mention it again and you might fall for it, but it doesn't mean anything. And that's what I think is so hard when, when a lot of people have a very typical setback, all of a sudden they're back at day one and it's this horrible thing. It's evidence that they'll never be free. And it's none of that. That's more thought, you know? So it, it, that's what the six week course does. It really kind of walks people through and understanding in that way i i, I mean i have a, a six-year-old and a, and a almost four-year-old and i mean if i if i if i see it right and and if i'm engaged in it like it, it's it's amazing to watch their their perspectives of the world and 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 in relation to other kids and adults and things like that like I, I mean, it, it seems simplistic to just, you know, you know, what would a child do or, you know, get back to that, that innocence. But I mean, it, it just, it, it reiterates how much that, that mental anguish and that, you know, that stimulus from the outside and, and what our parents said and their, the mantras we developed and how much that plays a part in changing our perspective. Yeah. you know, and, and like that worry and that anxiety, I know, like so many people can relate to and, and benefit and could, could use a relief from, yeah. um, it says on your website. And I, and I just want to quote you, uh, that several years ago, you came across a down to earth spiritual understanding that of life that changed everything for you. I, I wonder if you can just is that what you were uh, saying earlier? You couldn't put it into words. Am I, well, am I asking too much? No, I mean, I think it's exactly what we've been talking about. Okay. I saw that no matter what my mind was telling me, no matter what I felt, and I don't mean like I saw this, but like, it was an insight I had that someone, someone helped me with, this is not my theory or anything, but someone said, Hey, even though you've been in this habit for eight years and full of anxiety for X years, like you know, you're still healthy. You're free. You just have a tape running in your head. That's full of all this stuff. And that's not you. And even as I say it that way, it's so it sounds so oversimplified, but truly imagine like really knowing that 
really hearing our thoughts the way that we hear somebody else's thoughts. If you had a thought that said, Hey, I'm the queen of England, you'd be like, no, I'm not. But the thoughts that say, Hey, you're a jerk, (laughs) but you know, like the thoughts that say you're an addict, you're a jerk. Why'd you do that? I can't believe, you know, I regret you did this wrong. Like we don't hear those like the queen of England thought we hear those as absolute truth. They've been absolute truth immediately first person our whole life. It's that simple and and hard you know again we we have a lifetime of identifying with this but as we start to see it for what it is even a tiny bit i mean amazing things just start to open up we have a written assignment we have a written assignment here where i work and and it's an exercise where you write your assets and your defects and 10 out of 10 maybe 9 out of 10 but uh like everybody will write page to two pages on what's wrong with them and like what's good with them it's like maybe a paragraph and it's this constant struggle to like get that sixth or seventh line i experienced i see so many people it's interesting that our brains default is always what's wrong with me and 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 even healthcare like when you go to the doctor it's like what's wrong with me you yeah. know and we don't tell people on on a daily basis what's good with them and and i think if like we need to change healthcare and like are we looking at what's good with people and and what's what's good with them and 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 just focusing you know even the addiction world it's like you know the first assessments what's wrong with you and and we don't even get to what's what good with them until you actually get to know the person and so forth i think that should be done right away we're 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 we're, we're it's a learned behavior to constantly you know what's wrong with me we we only pay attention to people when there's something wrong with them unless you're sports figure obviously but it's just it's it's a bizarre thing that we're constantly trying to figure out what's wrong with people and we don't give any uh you know credit to what's good with them and and i learned that when i did this step four exercise i'm like what is what's up with this and uh you know so i try to tell people what's good with them when i can anyway well even even what what dr johnson just mentioned about like somebody saying to you that you like right now you're free like that that concept you know, is, is, it's just not what we hear when we're, when we're in that sort of like, you know, frontline treatment, our lives are a mess. You know, we feel useless. We're told that like, you need, uh, like you need help in every area of our lives, which is, it's true. But just to also say as well, you're, you're free. Right. And then, and like, how can we find that belief in that and, and that, you know, that process that engages that we are like at any given time, free, free to, to do. And like having someone who sees your health, you know, yeah. now when I work with people, like I see their health and it doesn't matter what they just did yesterday. It doesn't matter at all. Like I know there's a healthy them in there and they got caught up in thinking and, and you're right. Like our whole world conditions us to look at the opposite. We just look at the psychology mm-hmm. and we think that's the person. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, has been amazing. Uh, like just one, one last note on maintaining that sense of freedom. Like, like I said earlier, people sort of stop, you know, the personal work that they do and, you know, slowly fall back. Like, I mean, I think of any skill that I've learned, if I stop, I'm, I'm going to get, you know, slower at it and worse at it. And, and, and if I keep, say teaching somebody else to learn that skill that that's the maintenance right there and and is is that is that also you know a theory of yours or a belief in yours like i mean obviously your your you know all of this is is your profession and and whatnot but there i it seems like there's a deep passion to to help people mm-hmm. and and to you know can sort of maintain this positivity in your own life is that fair to say? I do think, I mean, yeah, for me personally, I talk about this all day, every day. So I'm not worried. Like I keep you're saying right. more because like, you're right all day, every day is all I talk about. Um, but I think for people who don't do this as a profession or who aren't a sponsor or doing any of that, like it's important to stay connected to, to what you've seen in some way. Like I, we say like stay in the conversation. So I you agree. listen to shows like this. You, you have even just a friend or two that you talk with occasionally, you know, like something and only because, you know, it does become our, our new normal and it does become effortless, but 
the whole world is conditioned to look at the opposite way. So it's like, no matter how deeply you know this, you are going to walk outside and, and people are going to see it the other way. And so it just, it's helpful to stay connected in ways yeah. like that. And the brain forgets, like you said, it generalizes. And when you generalize, you kind of forget all the the days in detox somehow just become uh, something you don't remember. Um, so we're talking to Dr. Amy Johnson. Uh, thanks for being on the show today. And, uh, you know, definitely an opportunity if you uh, have an addiction or some bad habits and, you know, 12 steps aren't your thing, you know, you just don't think that's what you want to do. You know, there's lots of opportunities out there for other pathways. And, and here's a book that you can read. And even if you are in 12 step recovery, and you got some habits going on, like uh, some of my yoga friends may have, uh, you can pick up this book to uh, to take a look at your habits and, and, and so forth as well. Uh, thank you very much for being on the show. The show is called the big little, the little book of big change. Yeah, <laughs> I think I said that wrong earlier. Um, thanks for being on our show, Amy, really appreciate it. And you can go to her website, which is Da, 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 da. come on dr amy johnson.com <laughs> there it is right. great facebook page great instagram page follower you can uh, grab all the links off of our facebook page if you're watching us on facebook thanks for being on the show and 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 you can change totally everyone's changeable thank you guys so much it's a great conversation awesome take care darren always good to see you see you all next thursday everybody you're listening to talk recovery radio 100.5 fm vancouver co-op radio special shout out to jordan our show coordinator getting all of our wonderful guests take care everybody